skeptic asks, does God fear, does Job fear God for nothing? Do you think humans serve God for themselves and for their own good? Or is service of God with no expected rewards even possible? What do you yes. think? Yes, yes to both of those? Or yes, yes what? Yes. yes what? Well, you can have atheists who are generous, kind, mm -hmm. don't know God mm -hmm. for no purpose other mm -hmm. than to be good people. Mm -hmm. um, do you think humans serve God for themselves and for their own good? Sure. People like so which is honor it? and glory. Yes. Yeah. Jesus said that too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're saying yes to both parts. Mm -hmm. But aren't we all human? I mean, it can't be about us. Ultimately, as Catholic Christians, we are called to do what we do because of who we are, not for any ultimate reward. Is that, but is that what the question? But the question isn't saying what we should do. It's saying it's. I think it's asking, I think do we? What is what like that? There are people that are like Oh, I so yeah. So so my so I'm hearing that both are po It's possible that people can can do things out of surely out of love. Mm -hmm. but, but, there are people but sometimes. Yes. That's all I'll read what I wrote. I'd rather you speak what you wrote. Okay. <laughs> nothing about you can read. Just rather than it's easier to listen when you try to just say it versus to read it to us. Spiritual development has nothing to do with age like physical development. A baby learns to crawl before walking. We may start out feeling we can earn God's favor, grace, and turn it up as a ticket to heaven. Hopefully spiritual development grows and matures into the realization of the scope of the debt you owe to God and you experience So we, so yeah, that's a good kind of moral. You know, we at the beginning of, I mean, all of us begin. We, we act morally out of hope for reward or fear of punishment. And as as we mature, if we mature and we develop, <laughs> that's the thing. If we mature, hopefully these things happen more because for for inward reasons. You and you can tell it's a great test of yourself when you don't get something that you thought you wanted. How do you respond to? Or if you've seen church people suddenly go, you know, it's like, wow. Um, then you realize that, again, again, not that they're the bad people, but, but that sometimes their, their reasons for doing things are not always high reasons. Do you think the dark night of the soul is the express laboratory of that idea? You know, John of the Cross. Say more. Say John more. the Cross and that idea that you don't get Mother Teresa. Comp, you know, you don't get compensation even in a feeling sense or a, you know, mm -hmm. consolation sense, then it's removed. And can you still remain can faithful? Can you still remain faithful when nobody's praising you? These uh -huh. Mother Teresa, people still said they were they still said she was saintly, even yeah. when she didn't think she was. Yeah. But that's just this is not a question, so <laughs>
not, I don't think it's an easy path. It's, it's, if, if, they, if people really believe that it's just a mental thing, if I turn on my switch, it doesn't matter what I do, they're going to be surprised. <laughs> so it's not, it's, it's not, it's not a, the harder road, it's just not the truth. Even St. Paul, even St. Paul didn't say that. So again, just this last week, we read Galatians on Tuesday, it, it was my favorite phrase. All that, what, circumcision or uncircumcision does not matter. All that matters is faith that works itself out through love. There it is. That's from Paul. Faith that works itself out through love. So any idea of faith alone has to, I mean, if, if you take, again, Luther, I think, had a more robust, when he said faith alone, he meant, well, he knew Paul, he knew that line from Galatians. But, but if, we, if we read it more literally, flatly, just that this mental belief thing, well, then I think we're going to be surprised and we find out we're going to have more growth that's going to be called of us as we mature as a human being and in the life beyond this life when God, if, you know, if our, our movement is towards God but not fully finished, then he finishes us with, you know, in purgatory. I mean, even if you don't believe in purgatory, there's purgatory. Um, and, um, and, you know, in, in my view, and, and so that will be when they discover, well, we'll discover things too. I'll discover things that I thought I had figured out are wrong. <laughs> and I think they may figure out that at that moment too. Well, I, I was just glad. I mean, the book is, is we don't, too often perhaps, you know, it's been my path. There's so much here. We look at it, try to understand it. But I just, you know, how, did, how do we apply this thing in our own spiritual life? And that was a, I have a very excellent question just to consider. Uh, in church people, there are church people who, there are non-church people who have figured that out, and there are church people who haven't figured that out. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, and um, that's, that's why we're here, to learn and to grow and to develop. Uh, because ultimately, I think we have to get there. If, if we don't live long enough or don't use our time well, well, then we trust them to God who will be the best teacher uh, um, after they die, after we die, uh, to instruct us in what we haven't understood or grasped. <coughs> All right. Let's look at the text. Um, again, I, we're on the, for lesson 1.5, and I look again at what you were asked to read. There are some passages I'm going to we're going to read together that weren't in that, and I've probably done it in the past. Let me just some, some general comments. The second cycle of speeches is chapter 15 through chapter 21, as you see on that little half sheet. In the first cycle, the three friends argued for God's moral governance of the world. Uh, they explained Job's sorry situation by his guilt. He's responsible for something. He just won't admit it. For his part, Job initially sought more escape from his life of pain, but eventually he began to reflect on the question of justice, and he made mention of seeking a trial that would establish his innocence. He wonders if justice has not gone wrong in general, and so he wonders if he's already presumed guilty. In the second cycle, the friends turn more and more unfriendly, concentrating on lurid visions of the punishment that, of, of the wicked, uh, with the implication that Job is undergoing some version of this. He's undergoing terrible pain, it's because he's wicked. Job, in turn, turns unfriendly to God and will limit direct address to God. He will speak to God less and less as we presume, presume or proceed through the text. Twice he will call on an imagined third party, a witness, air quote, whose power is to decide, whose power to decide he affirms. Somebody who can step in and say, who is right? Is God right or am I right? Okay. Um, Job implicitly argues with his friends that he is being punished and he seeks a trial to clear himself. His horrific, vis vivid descriptions of God's attacks match his friends' visions of divine punishment. Let's look at chapter 16, verse 19. Well, chapter 16, this is Job's fourth response. In verse 7, he starts... Surely now God has worn me out. He has made desolate all my company. He has shriveled me up. Huh? Then skip to verse 12. 
12. I was at ease, and he broke me asunder. He seized me by the neck and dashed me to pieces. He set me up as his target. His archers surround me. He slashes open my kidneys. He does not spare me. He pours out my gall on the ground. Verse 18. He calls, notice he calls on the earth. O oh, earth, hide not my blood. Let my cry find no resting place. For even now, behold, my witness is in heaven, and he that vouches for me is on high. Now initially, you might assume it's got to be God. Except he just accused God of being terribly unfair to him. Okay? So just, just say, it may be God, but I, I would question that maybe there's something else going on in Job. But he's asking for a third kind of an umpire. Because he's blaming, he's beginning to, he's beginning to say God's not being fair. And, and it's true, God is not being fair, just, you know, the law of retribution way. Turn to chapter 19. This is the, the most famous path. Again, if you've ever had to plan a funeral and you're given the funeral ritual, there are not a lot of Old Testament readings in, uh, for, for funerals. Because as I've beaten you over the head many times, there wasn't a real hope for life beyond this life through most of the Old Testament. But one text from Job is there, and it's this, chapter 19. Um, let's start with verse 7, I think, huh? Again, it's Job. Behold, I cry out, violence, but I am not answered. That was the same word that Habakkuk cried out, huh? Violence, but I am not answered. I call aloud, but there is no justice. He has walled up my way so that I cannot pass. He has set darkness upon my paths. He has stripped me, stripped from me my glory and taken the crown from my head. He breaks me down on every side and I am gone and my hope has he pulled up like a tree. This is God he's talking about. Huh? He has kindled his wrath against me and counts me as his adversary. His troops come on together. They have cast up siege works against me. Verse 21. Have pity on me, have pity on me, O you, my friends. For the hand of God has touched me. Why do you, like God, pursue me? Why are you not satisfied with my flesh? Okay, so he's, he's saying, you're, you're eating me up. Oh, that my words were written down. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. Well, they are, actually, huh? <laughs> that they were graven in the rock forever. For I know that my Redeemer, now in my Bible, it's a capital R, okay? Which, which, which is really telling. I know that my Redeemer lives, and at last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, then from my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see on my side, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. Now, that is that famous passage, and I, I alluded to it with the Messiah. I know that my Redeemer lives, and in my body shall I see God. Which comes out of the blue to seem to be an expression of resurrected life, or re resurrected hope. Okay? But check your footnotes. Here, now, this is the RSV I'm reading from. The RSV. Here are the footnotes that are not, not the footnotes in the RSV that I have aren't explanatory notes, they're textual notes. They'll, they say, um, so there's a bunch of them. Uh, on Redeemer, in verse 25, it says, or Vindicator. And uh, upon the earth, on verse 25, it, says, it could be dust. Um, then from my flesh, or it could be without my flesh. And then, and then the line, then from my flesh I shall see God. The note says, the meaning of this verse is uncertain. So what, you have, what, were, what I read to you, what Handel set to music, what, is, what people are thinking of when they ask this text to be read at a funeral, is really kind of a Christian... See, the Hebrew is just very <coughs> complex. We don't, it, we don't know what the Hebrew is saying. So the translators turn to... What did the Greek the Septuagint say? What's the Greek translation say? What did the Vulgate, what did Jerome say in the Latin? And it's from those things that they get this. But what you have, I would propose, in the Vulgate and the Septuagint 
is a Christianized. I mean, they took a, a text that was difficult and they made it less difficult. So I'm just trying to say this is not what it appears to be. It appears to be, oh my gosh, a glimpse of the resurrection. I say, no, it's a Christian, it's later Christians kind of reading it into the text. Are you following me? Because the original Hebrew is not saying that. It's not as we don't know what it says. It's it's just it, it's just not clear what it's trying to say. And so you want to make it clear for people, and so you kind of do, but it's really based a little bit on the text, a little bit on your own beliefs. And these are Christians. You know, Vulgate was, Jerome was a Christian. Septuagint was used by Christians. And so it, 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 it shows a further thinking of the, of the idea that probably is not original to the author. Accepting what I'm trying to say here. So the, it's, a, it's a, love, a much loved passage. You'll see it in you know, funeral cards and you know, <laughs> that music is sung and and there it's become something more. It's become, it, has, it does express, a, it expresses a different view than, than the book of Job itself views. Because there's no resurrection. But what is Job asking for? He's asking for that umpire who can mediate between God and himself. Because Job says, I'm an innocent man. And I'm suffering like I'm not an innocent man. I, that's why I want my words written in stone. I want them to last forever so that when I'm gone, somebody can say, here was an innocent man who suffered innocently. Now, he, it may sound like he's angry at God. Well, he's angry. <laughs> but, you know, but again, remember chapter 1 and 2, it's, you know, it, he, doesn't, he doesn't know what's going on. We, the readers, know what's going on. So it's a very delicate thing I just brought you to see, that, that the text, as we hear it, has been, in a sense, Christianized. And that's okay. I mean, you know, when we read it at a funeral, we have the Gospels. You know, we're going to read, we're going to hear from the Gospel. We're going to hear from St. Paul. And yes, we do have a belief in life beyond this life. But my question is, the statement is, it's not likely that the book of Job, that the, the poet of Job was expressing that. Okay. Yes. So, translation I have is vindicator. Vindicator. And I think that's in some ways just a bit better because a redeemer is someone who redeems you Rescues. regardless of guilt. Pulls you right? out of the situation. Right. You were kidnapped and I, I pulled you right. out. Regardless of you you brought it on yourself or whatever. And a vindicator is someone who just agrees with the fact that you are righteous. But there'll always be yeah. somebody saying Job was a righteous man. He didn't deserve that. He's so a righteous fits man. The Jewish, better. yes, yeah, yeah. The Redeemer fits the Christian better. Yes, <laughs> yes. See again, the Redeemer. Again, the RSV is the grandchild of the King James Bible. Okay, and so that, that's why you know that's why the these and the thous are in here yet because the the, the trans, people who, who love this Bible translation didn't want to give up the these and the thous and. And you know the capital R Redeemer, and so the the translators, you know, kind of <coughs> blinked and put all this junk in the notes <laughs> to say that this is really a bad translation. But if we change this, they're going to hang us up. Okay, so this was the 1940s in the translator. So again, read your footnotes. You'll see this. It's again, it's it's a beautiful passage, and it it express it, it does express a Christian understanding. But, the, but the, what scholars are saying, it doesn't express what Job was trying to say. That's where the vindicator idea, the, the umpire, the man who, who can testify to his innocence. I, 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 will, I believe I have somebody, there will be somebody who will remember, remind the world that I was an innocent man and I suffered. Yes? So it's kind of like when we were doing the prophets, the difference between the virgin and the young woman. Mm -hmm. Christianization, it, yes. As we hear it, as even the translations that we use, probably a newer translation has been a little more free to acknowledge. Like again, mine has Redeemer with a footnote to Vindicator, but yours is Vindicator, which shows again, okay, we, we can step a little bit forward and we can acknowledge what the text really seems to say. Okay? All right. So, uh, la, 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 la. There's just a ton of stuff that we could read, but I'm not going to drag you through all of that. Let's go to um, chapter 22. Well, yeah, 22. Uh, 
actually, let's read a little of 21, just because it's just great poetry. Not because it, you know, this is, this is Job's sixth response. And in verse 19, he, he starts out, in my translation, you say God stores up their iniquity for their sins. So, that, so he's, 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 say, he's telling the friends what they say. Let him recompense it to themselves that they may know it. Let their own eyes see their destruction. Let them drink of the wrath of the Almighty. Um, behold, I know your... Uh, no, I shouldn't have dragged you. It's in the middle of an argument, and I, sh I shouldn't have dragged you into it. Uh, never mind. Let's, let's not go there. <laughs> Chapter 22 begins the third cycle of speeches. From 22, 1 to 27 to the end of that chapter. You are not asked to read any of it. Okay? What happens here? This is even a shorter cycle. Now, as you look, if you look on your little half sheet here, there is no third speech uh, by Zophar. The, it, the cycle is kind of breaking down. You know, the, the first cycle, everybody had one or two chapter responses. And then in the second cycle, there's only one two chapter cycle. And by the third cycle, it's kind of breaking down. It's like, I don't, we don't know if the text got, over the years, something just fell out, or, or if, it was the intention, if it's the intentional uh, presentation by, by the poet here. But in this, uh, so this cycle is shorter than the second cycle. It elaborates the incompatibility of suffering with the idea that God is just. Again, the Hebrew text is really messed up, textually confused, things are out of order, and so you'll find, if you read it all, you'll see a lot of little footnotes like the one I just said, well, it, or it could be this, or it could be that. So again, is the poem, it's, is the poem intentionally disintegrating, or is it just an accident of copying over the centuries where it, it kind of broke down, people got tired writing it, and so they kind of gave up on it. Uh, anyway, we're not going to read any of it. Um, in the third cycle, uh, the, the friends lambast Job, but ultimately they promise a future, uh, and, and Zophar has nothing to say at all. I mean, it's like, it's like the, the argument back and forth has become more and more intense. Chapter 28. This is, this is the so-called interlude, huh? or intermission. And it's, it's about nothing that we've been talking about, except in the broad sense, it's about wisdom and where you find wisdom. It celebrates the inaccessibility of wisdom. Now, most scholars propose that it's a late addition uh, that you know, that's, was kind of imposed I, I, I don't necessarily see it that way. Again, I just think the text is a long one, and it's a dialogue, it's a theater piece. And you know, you need to have a little, even, even well, Shakespeare, many Shakespearean plays have comic characters who give a little ha 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 in the middle of the play to kind of just give your mind a little step back from the intensity. Well, maybe it's just, it's just it's a, think of it as an intermission or a little, a uh, little, what do you call it, that cleanses your palate, the um, uh, thing you drink, uh, sorbet. sorbet, a little sorbet to cleanse your palate. Uh, it's a reflection on the theme of, of, of wisdom. Let's read a little bit about that. Surely there is a mine for silver and a place for gold which they refine. But the implication is, but there is no mine for wisdom. <laughs> you can't find wisdom in the ground. Look at verse 12. Where shall wisdom be found? Where is the place of understanding? It is not found in the land of the living. The deep says, it is not in me. The sea says, it is not with me. It cannot be gotten for gold. Silver cannot be weighed as its price, so it can't be bought. Uh, verse 20 again has a refrain. Where then does wisdom come from? Where is the place of understanding? It is hidden from the eyes of all the living. Verse 23. 
God understands the way to it. So the, re the refrain is, only God knows where wisdom is. Okay? God understands the way to it, and he knows its place. For he looks to the ends of the earth. He sees everything under the heavens. When he gave to the wind its weight and meted out the waters by measure, when he had made a degree, decree for the rain at creation, and a way for the lightning and the thunder, then he saw it and declared it, he established it and searched it, and he said to man, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. Notice that no character speaks this. This is it's, it's an, it is an interlude. It's an aside for the reader. All right? And it does again, it, it does conform to the traditional view of wisdom, and it, it and it, sent, it hints at where, where that, that wisdom is God's thing and it's not really our thing. We can't dig it, we can't buy it. It's a thing from God. And so maybe there's, so maybe that's good. I mean, it's kind of a, a slight introduction to the conclusion that we're going to find at the end of the book when God speaks. But, but, but again, that's just, the interlude's over, Beyonce walks off the stage, and Joel gives his peroration, or his final speech. It is very dramatic, uh, soaring poem in three, three panels. Thanks be to God, unlike the earlier arguments, it has, you can, you can plot the narrative. Chapter 29 reflects on the good old days. Chapter 30 is presently, it's the pits. And chapter 31 is a series of oaths of Job's innocence. Okay? I love it. It's a beautiful poem, so let's read a little bit of it. 29. Okay, past happiness. Verse 2. Oh, that I were as in the months of old, as in the days when God watched over me, when his lamp shone upon my head, and by his light I walked through darkness. And I was in my autumn days, when the friendship of God was upon my tent, when the Almighty was yet with me, when my children were about me, when my steps were washed with milk, and the rock poured out for me streams of oil, when I went out to the gate of the city, when I prepared my seat in the square, the young men saw me and withdrew, and the aged rose and stood, the princes refrained from talking and laid their hand on their mouth. The voice of the nobles was hushed and their tongue cleaved to the roof of their mouth. So Job thinks back to the days when he was something special. Okay, verse 12. Because I delivered the poor who cried and the fatherless who had none to help him. The blessing of him who was about to perish came upon me and I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. Verse 15, I was eyes to the blind and feet to the lame. I was father to the poor, and I searched out the cause of him whom I did not know. I broke the fangs of the unrighteous and made him drop his prey from his teeth. Then I thought, I shall die in my nest, and I shall multiply my days as the sand. Now, you might say, God, he's kind of arrogant. But remember, it's true, okay? Amen. Don't, don't try to undercut Job. Remember the very first verse of the book. Let me read it for you again. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. The man was blameless and upright, feared God, and turned away from evil. Now, you and I say in chapter 29, that would be arrogance. But for him, it's the truth. Then, chapter 30, current situation. But now they make sport of me, men who are younger than I, whose fathers I would have disdained to set with the dogs of my flock. <laughs> what could I gain from the strength of their hands, men whose vigor is gone? Through want and hard hunger they gnaw the dry and desolate ground. Even the poor mock him now. Verse 9. Now I have become their song. I am a byword to them. They abhor me. They keep aloof from me. They do not hesitate to spit at the sight of me because God has loosed my cord like a bow, like a, bow a bowstring. He's a, he, God has, has um, loosed 
my bowstring and humbled me, they have cast off restraint in my presence. Verse 20. I cry to you and you do not answer me. I stand and you do not heed me. You have turned cruel to me. With the might of your hand, you persecute me. You lift me up on the wind. You make me ride on it. And then you toss me about in the roar of the storm. Yes, I know that you will bring me to death and to the house appointed for all the living. So he says, God, you, you, this is what you're going to do. I get it. You're going to do it to me, though I don't deserve it. Then in chapter 31 comes a whole series of self-deprecating oaths. If I have done this, may this happen to me. So uh, look at verse 16. There's, there's, we already you know, skipped over. Maybe, messed up these verses, huh? maybe, they have, yeah, maybe they're really mess, messed up here. In my translation, it starts out, if I have withheld anything that the poor desire, or have caused the eyes of the widow to fail, or if I have eaten my morsel alone, and the fatherless has not eaten from it, then, you know, then the, the implication is, well, then may God strike me dead. Okay? If I have, verse 19, if I have seen anyone perish for lack of clothing, or a poor man without covering, may God strike me dead. Um, if the poor man's loins have not blessed me, and if he was not warm with the fleece of my sheep, may God strike me dead. If I raise my hand against the fatherless because I saw help in the gate, then let my shoulder blade fall from my shoulder and let my arm be broken from its socket. Verse 24, if I made gold my trust or called fine gold my confidence, if I rejoiced because my wealth was great or because my, my hand had gotten much, if I had looked at the sun when it shone or the moon moving in splendor, as if implied, as if it were a god. Um, verse 33, if I have concealed my transgressions from men by hiding my iniquity in my bosom because I stood in great fear of the multitude and the contempt of families terrified me so that I kept silence and did not go out of doors, I was a hypocrite, he's saying. Oh, that I had one to hear me. Here is my signature. Let the Almighty answer me. Oh, that I had the indictment written by my adversary. Surely I would carry it on my shoulder. I would bind it to me as a crown. <laughs> I would give him an account of all my steps. Like a prince, I would approach him. And then skip verses eight, uh, 38, 39, and 40 are probably out of place. And then it says, the words of Job are ended. Okay. So... That's Job's last big speech. I remember when I, before all of this, how I was on top of the world. And now I'm miserable, and I make all these oaths that I have not done these things to deserve that. It's a very powerful summary of his situation and his case. The words of Job are ended. And again, you would expect at this point God's going to pop up, but no, here's where Eli, Elihu speaks up. Um, notice there is no response from Job to Elihu's speech. Again, that's what leads scholars to think that this is a later imposition. That, you know, that somebody wrote up Elihu's speech and then it was kind of stuck in because Job doesn't answer. Job's words are over. The next time he speaks, he's responding to God and says, I can see that I'm over my head. Okay? But and at least the book does does reiterate themes we've seen before. It shows that the young are no better than the, than the, than the old uh, when it comes to uh, being wise. Um, let's, let's read just a little, a little bit of it so you can say, 30, chapter 33, verse 19. Man is chastened with pain upon his bed and with continual strife in his bones. Is that the right verse, Mark? Yes. Mm -hmm. So that his life loathes bread and his appetite dainty food. His flesh is so wasted away that it cannot be seen. His bones, which were not seen, stick out. His soul draws near the pit. His life to those who bring death. If there be for him an angel, a mediator, one of the thousand, so declared to man what is right to him, he is gracious to him and says, Deliver him from going down to the pit. I have found a ransom. Let his flesh become fresh with youth. 
Let them return to the days of his youthful vigor. Then man prays to God, and he accepts him. He comes into his presence with joy. Okay, what did he try to say there? He said, Elihu was saying, well, God sometimes sends painful things to make you wake up. That pain has a medicinal reason. He's trying to argue. Again, that's true. I mean, pain does do that for us. So Elihu is, again, giving us conventional wisdom. His problem is in applying it to Job, who we were told is an innocent man. Okay, so that's, that's kind of the bluster of Elihu. Chapter 38. Okay, now this is the big climax. <coughs> but, I, but I must suggest, I, I propose that while it's beautiful poetry, it's amazingly beautiful poetry, it, it doesn't seem to address the question. Huh? At first sight, the divine reply is striking for its irrelevance. There's only one moment where the question of Job's innocent suffering is brought up in chapter 40. In the first, we are shown the useful, the first, he gets two, two great speeches. In the, initially, we are going to be shown the useful, bizarre, and playful elements of creation in a torrent of questions that suggest that God's ways are inscrutable. In the second speech, we are going to be given descriptions of two great beasts. We don't know whether they're real or mythic. It's not clear. I would suggest that the first speech is serving to refute Job's questioning that there is order in the universe. All these questions from God are trying to imply that there is order. Now, you may not understand it, Job, but there is order to the universe. That human beings do not just create things for God's, for, for humanity's pleasure, but for, the, for God's pleasure. That's the theme of the second speech. These weird, cre the creatures are either the hippopotamus and the, the elephant, or they're two mythic beasts. But in any case, the, the, the second series of questions says, look what I've done, <clears throat> Joel. Look at this weird, wild creature I have made. The hippo, the elephant. Right? Who would create an animal like because I do it for my pleasure. It may not prove, it may not, for, not for your sake, it's for my sake. So again, I think, I think we can make the point that the two speeches are trying to, 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 to deny Job's arguments that there is no order to the universe, but secondly, to, to raise Job's attention that maybe, that maybe God makes things or does things for his pleasure, not for our pleasure. Okay, so here goes. Join me. Chapter 38. 38. 38. So this is where Yahweh speaks. The Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Again, the whirlwind, that's all, that's the theophany stuff, you know? The, the thunder, the lightning, the cloud. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man, and I will question you, and you shall declare to me. First, God describes creation like the building of a building. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Again, even God <laughs> is sarcastic. Huh? Again, the sarcasm quotient is going up through the whole book. Or who stretched the line upon it? Again, like a, like a carpenter with his measure. Huh? Or what were its bases? What were its bases? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Okay. So, again, the image is God creates like a carpenter builds a building. The next series of images is like creation is like the birth of a baby. Or, so, who shut in the sea with doors when it burst forth from the womb? See, again, the first model, the first metaphor was building, the second metaphor is birth. When I made clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band, like a baby. 
and prescribe bounds for it and set bars and doors like you would do for your children. You'd set up an, an area where they can't fall from the stairs. Well, God did that to the ocean and said, Thus far shall you come and no farther, and here shall, you, here shall your proud waves be stayed. Have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place? that it might take hold of the skirts of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it. It is chained, changed like clay under the seal and is dyed like a garment. Again, think of pouring wax on an envelope and then you have a signet ring and you stamp it down and then you pull back the signet and it reveals the, sh that the shape of the image on the ring. Okay? It is dyed like a garment from the wicked that light is withheld, and their uplifted arm is broken. Um, then he, he asks questions about, you know, does he know the depths of the sea and the gates of darkness and the, you know, the physical layout of the universe? Go to verse 19. Where is the way to the dwelling of light? Hmm? Where is the place of darkness that you may take it to its territory, that you may discern the paths to its home? You know, for you were born then, right? And the number of your days is great. Uh-huh. Again, yeah, sarcasm. Mm -hmm. Then weather is talked about. Have you entered the storehouses of the snow? Have you seen the storehouses of the hail, which I have reserved for the time of trouble, for the day of battle and war? What is the way to the place where the light is distributed, or where the east wind is scattered upon the earth? Who has cleft a channel for the torrents of rain, and a way for the thunderbolt? to bring a rain on a land where no man is, on the desert in which there is no man. Verse 28. So we, this is all about weather. Has the rain a father? Or who has begotten the drops of dew? From whose womb did the ice come forth? Who has given birth to the hoarfrost of earth? And then he goes to talk about the stars. Verse 31. Can you bind the chains of the Pleiades or loose the cords of Orion? Can you lead forth the Matzaroth in their season? We have no idea what Matzaroth means. Or can you guide the bear with its children? Remember, big, there's the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper. Big Bear and Little Bear. Huh? Verse 34. Or can you lift up your voice to the clouds that a flood of waters may cover you? Can you send forth lightnings that they may go and say to you, here we are? Verse 39. Here, but verse 39 begins a whole series of descriptions of animals. Big animals, weird animals, okay? Now again, remember the theme here is there is order to the universe, Job. It may not please you, it may not be the kind of order you're expecting, but there's order. Look at all of this. And, and modern science would agree, I mean, to say about how things have developed and how held in place. But 30, 39, 38, 39. Chapter 38, verse 39, begins the animal pieces. Can you hunt the prey for the lion or satisfy the appetite of the young lion when they crouch in the dens or lie in wait in their co covert? Who provides for the raven its prey when its young ones cry out to God and wander about for lack of food? And now, th 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 uh, chapter 39, do you, keep, do you know when the mountain goats come forth? Do you observe the calving of the hinds? Verse 5. Who has let the wild ass go free? Who has loosed the bonds of the swift ass, to whom I have given the step for its home? Verse 9. Is the wild ox willing to serve you? Will he spend the night at your crib? Verse 19. There's a big, long poem about horses. The, the poet here just shows his affection for horses. Do you give the horse his might? Do you clothe his neck with strength? Do you make him leap like the locust? His majestic snorting is terrible. He paws in the valley and exalts in his strength. He goes out to meet the, wep the weapons, like cavalry horses. He laughs at fear and is not dismayed. He does not turn back from the sword. Upon him rattle the quiver, the flashing spear and the javelin. With fierceness and rage, he swallows the ground. I mean, he runs over it so fast like he's eating up the ground as he travels. With fierceness and rage, he swallows the ground. He cannot stand still in the sound of the trumpet. 
When the trumpet sounds, he says, Aha! He smells the battle from afar, the thunder of the captains and the shouting. Next comes a thing about the hawk, which scholars propose belongs earlier when he was talking about uh, other animals. Okay. Chapter 40. The Lord said to Job, Shall a fault finder contend with the Almighty? He who argues with God, let him answer it. So God throws down the gauntlet. Okay, Job, the floor is yours. Job answers the Lord. Behold, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand to my mouth. I have spoken once, and I will not answer. Twice, but I will proceed no further. So God's questions have silenced Job. Now, we don't. We don't know what, we know it's hard, we know what he does, Joel, but we don't know why he doesn't. Just saying that. It's kind of hard to know what, is, is, is he just crushed or is he, is, he, is he learned something? Again, it's hard to know. And now this book could end there. But then God winds up again. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. This is an exact repetition of chapter 38, verse 1. Gird up your loins like a man. And I will question you, and, de and you can declare to me, will you even put me in the wrong? Will you condemn me that you may be justified? Will you put me in the wrong? Will you condemn me that you may be justified? Deck yourself with magic. So that, that, this is the only section of God's speech that does de relate to the rest of the book, and that, that it asks the question, does God allow evil? The innocent people. And this is that's the only time it gets addressed by God. Because then he moves on. Deck yourself with majesty and dignity. Clothe yourself with glory and splendor. Pour forth the offerings. I'm sorry, the overflowings of your anger. Look on everyone that is proud and abase him. Look on everyone that is proud and bring him low. Tread down the wicked where they stand. Hide them all in the dust together. Bind their faces in the world below. Then will I also acknowledge to you that your own right hand can give you victory. Deal with human arrogance. And then I will acknowledge your power. Now begins the descriptions of these two creatures. And again, the word behemoth, you've seen that word before. This is where it's a proper name. It's a capital B in my book. Huh? And is it some kind of mythical creature, like a dragon? Or is it a hippo, like in the, Na the Nile? Well, it could be both, but just scholars don't know. Behold, behemoth, which I made as I made you. He eats grass like an ox. Verse 21. Under the lotus plants he lies, in the covert of the reeds and in the marsh. Um, for, his, for his shade the lotus trees cover him. The willows of the brook surround him. So now, to me, that does sound like a hippo, but you know. But then look at chapter 41, which could either be again a dragon or a crocodile. Okay? The word here is Leviathan. You've heard that word used too of a giant, huh? Can you draw out Leviathan with a hook or press down his tongue with a cord? Can you put a rope in his nose or pierce his jaw with a hook? Will he make many supplications to you? Will he speak to you soft words? Bed talk? Will he make a covenant with you to take him for your servant forever? Will you play with him as with a bird? Will you put him on leash for your maidens? Verse 13. Who can strip off his outer garment? Who can penetrate his double coat of mail? Verse 20. Out of his nostrils comes forth smoke as from a boiling pot and burning rushes. Now, real crocodiles don't have smoke come out of their nostrils. So it's a phrase like this that makes them wonder it's about some, some mythic dragon-type creature. Verse 24, his heart is hard as stone, hard as the nether millstone. When he raises himself up, the mighty are afraid. At the crashing, they are beside themselves. And so on goes the descriptions of these two creatures, okay? So let's just step back again and summarize what has God done. There's two speeches. In the first speech, I would argue, 
Uh, God is relating that there is an order in creation. And he starts by describing, by asking Job to look at you know, creation like a building of a great house, or like the, like the sea, like the birth of a baby, and the creatures in it with all their weird and strange uh, qualities. Uh, does that not suggest that there's some a mind behind this? He implies. Now again, modern evolutionary science will see all of that without necessarily buying into a god, but that's the argument being made. Second speech is that God sometimes does weird things. He makes creatures that don't make any sense. It, he would refute Job's charge that God is unjust in the sense that God is unable to restrain evil. Uh, these two beasts uh, are shown to be very much alive, though God holds them on the leash. So God can control wickedness and evil. God can control Leviathan and Behemoth. So Job must live in a universe where they roam. God, God is saying Job has to live in a world where there are weird creatures that make no sense to him. But that should not mean that God does not have control over them. Though Job has no place for them or purpose, God has a use for them. It's, it's magnificent poetry. Then chapter 42. Then Job answers the Lord. I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Verse 5. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore I despise myself, and repent in dust and ashes. I'm curious as what your translations have for verse 6. Mine again. Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ash. What does yours have? Same thing? Disown. Okay. Disown? I disown myself. Okay. All my braggadocia. What I have said. I disown myself. What I have said. Okay. I have, I have, I, great. Very good. That's, a, that's an excellent translation. I have disowned what I have said and I repent in dust and ashes. Now, what's going to follow, you see, we go from poetry to prose. Okay, so we're going to, so Job's going to get pretty much everything back. There's only, we're going to come back to it after lunch. We'll say, okay, so what did we just deal with here? I mean, I, I grant you that the book of Job does not address this question the way we would like, but it does give us an answer. So let's read a little further. Let's read about the prose part, because we don't have time for the other. After the Lord had spoken these words to Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz. So, so God turned to the three friends. My wrath is kindled against you and against your two friends. Notice again, Elihu is not mentioned. He's not there. He's not included in God's speech. That's, that's part of the argument that it was a later addition. Okay? For you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. See, God has just kind of reamed Job out in a manner of speaking. But in the end, he says, <laughs> God, that Job has spoken of me correctly. That I am kind of wild and crazy. That I do sometimes things that make no sense to you. That I don't conform to your rule of the law of retribution. Okay? That's, that's, what, that's the import there. God is saying, because he's, he's, what he's doing is he's, he's pulling the shorts on these guys who have been arguing the whole time for the traditional view of the law, of, of, of wisdom, that God rewards the just and punishes the wicked. Then, he, then God tells the three friends to make some offerings um, and, then, and, and ask my servant Job to pray for you. For I will accept his prayer, not to deal with you according to your folly. For you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. In verse 10, the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends. And the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. 
Now, that seems to go back to say that the law of retribution really works, doesn't it? I mean, I mean it, it's, it's, it's kind of weird. It's kind of a weird book. In the end, Job gets it all back, back doubly. Now, too bad for the kids who were killed, but these are new kids. Okay? Verse 12. And the Lord blessed the later days, the, la the latter days of Job more than his beginning. Verse thirteen. He had also had seven sons and three daughters. Verse sixteen. And after this, Job lived a hundred and forty years and saw his sons and his sons' sons four generations. And Job died an old man, full of days. Okay, we'll come back and kick it apart. Like what's what's he saying? Let's say a word of prayer for the meal. Okay? What a gracious giver of gifts. We have